We love it. We love it. We love looking at plays, breaking down all the things. Let's get started. We're looking at five plays. Stick around. Greetings and welcome back to another episode of Five Play Friday, the show where we take a look at all of the things related to officiating basketball. We're looking at the positioning of the crew, trying to take the positives, avoid the negatives, and get better as basketball officials. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with TheBetterOfficial.com. We craft video to help basketball officials get better and take control of their officiating career analyzing game video, looking at plays, seeing unique plays, right? So that we can say when we see them on the court, we have a little bit of recall. Hey, I've seen that play before. I think I know what the issues are, et cetera. So we could adjudicate those plays properly, but we're always analyzing game video for the, the habits and fundamentals displayed. We want as officials to have tremendous habits and fundamentals. But before we get started on the show, take a moment. Think about it and hit like, subscribe, and notify so that you don't miss out on any of our video content. If this is the content that you find valuable, don't miss out. Hit the subscribe button and the notification bell because we go live every Wednesday and Friday during the basketball season. You don't want to miss out on that. Jump in the game, put your voice in the game, and we can all get better together. Allow me a moment to thank our tremendous show supporters, Bob Marshall, Chili Bob, Zach Burns, Eric Erickson, Greg Godsell, and Paul Sullivan. Much appreciated and much love. If you want to support the show, there will always be a link in the show notes below. All right, let's look at plays. Let's start today with play number one. All right, so possible basket interference on this play. Let's take a look at all of the things, right? So key thing to understand here is that it is illegal to contact the basket while the ball is on or in the basket. So obviously step number one is, what's a basket? (laughs) The basket consists of the ring and the net and the flange, which holds the ring against the backboard. Those three components. So all of the metal part plus the net is part of the basket. This ball settles on the basket, right? It's like on the back part, on the flange. It actually appears to come to rest. And then the player contacts the net. That oscillation causes the ball to enter the basket. This is a basket interference violation by rule, right? So some key things on this play that we have to think about, right? Trail and center official would be responsible for this action and figuring it out, right? If we look, right? So initially, what do we have? We have a player go to the floor. They're directly under the basket. We have competition on a shot, right? So everything about this play is pulling the official's attention down low. That player on the floor, is somebody going to trip over them, et cetera? Was that legally uh, dealt with there? And then ultimately a subtle flail, right, and causes that, right? So we recognize on this play, as officials, our attention is brought down, And we can miss this, right? 
but we can always come late with this kind of play as well because this is a basket violation by rule there's a lot of reasons why our attention is brought down to the floor we have got a player on the floor we've got action on the floor another player goes down right so this player block charge right embellish but he's under the basket and then Another player sort of gets whipped out of there and he goes to the floor, right? Everything bringing our attention down, right? So this is a play that we can miss as the trail on this play, but center official does not really have that action, right? Center official, I think we see a slight disengagement here, right? Let's take a look. No call. Right, that disengagement right there, anytime we can identify in our game video disengagement as center or trail, we're much less likely in that situation to make a ruling on a play. Just because we've, we've, we've it's, just a, it's just a human being thing, right? And of the ability to fight through that. Sometimes you'll see officials, they do disengage, but then they come in with the correct call. The physical disengagement doesn't affect them. But oftentimes we see officials, when they do have that physical, physical disengagement, that becomes an issue. So a missed call on this play, good one to look at, right? We could also talk about trust as a crew, right? Do I trust my partners are going to deal with the stuff down below? Am I, if I'm trail here, like first thing we look at is the trail's uh, positioning on the play, right? Working nice and low as trail in this situation. All the players are below the free throw line. This is great positioning. We're looking, we're looking. Sometimes though, we just don't perceive something that happens in front of us, right? Next time we know, you know, we don't want to miss that. Great position, great demeanor by the trail. It's just the, you know, we sort of, we sort of like waiting for the illegal waiting for the illegal to go off, doesn't go off. Why didn't it go off? Maybe it's because I was looking down. Maybe it's because, you know, other fact, maybe I didn't know that that was illegal, right? And now I know it's illegal and so I can improve for next time. But in the end, right, if we watch the ball, it appears to come to rest here. We can see this shiny logo, right? It actually settles before the contact, right? Yeah. That's an interesting play. We like it. We like it. So takeaways on the play. Great position. Don't disengage. Keep our eyes up when we have plays to the basket. Even when everything about the play says bring your attention down. Give me just a second. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those would be our takeaways on the play, right? Great position as trail. Center has that disengagement and anticipation of going the other way. If we can try to eliminate that from our game, we're better as basketball officials. We miss the obvious violation. A lot of things that bringing our attention down to the floor. It's It's a... It's not something we see every day. It's a pretty subtle if we have our attention focused down low. And so but we need to understand that by rule, this is a violation. That would be the number one takeaway. We need to get this, no goal, et cetera. Wipe that off and we'll be good to go. You can contact the basket when the ball is above the cylinder. That could be a misconception, right? The ball's in the cylinder. And a player, I like to say, you know, it's just like you can play the bongos on the ring, right? There's no restriction when the ball is in the cylinder. If it's on or in the basket, it is a violation. And that violation, though, to be clear, is not goaltending. It is basket interference. Even though the penalty is going to be the same, it is basket interference by rule, not goaltending. At knowing the distinction is helps us when we're, you know, communicating a ruling on the play. That is basket interference by rule. Contacted the basket while the ball was on or in the basket. Whoa, whoa. You say that to a coach, what's he going to say? <laughs> I got you. I got you with my rules book language. All right, a good first play to get us started. 
let's take a look at play number two. What do we have on this play? Right, so the continuous motion rule states that when there is a defoul, a foul by any defensive player, a player who has begun their habitual throwing motion is allowed to complete that motion. The ball has not become dead in this instance until the result of that completed motion is determined, right? So does this player begin the, mo the habitual actions that precede the try for goal? That is what we need to determine on this play. And that's what we need to determine on any continuous motion play. So I got this play from uh, John McMillan on Basketball Rules Talk, a Facebook group. I'll put a link in the show notes below um, if you are not yet a member of that group. And it's a great one because it, expo it we have a complete look at the entire play, right? It's all opened up in front of us. It's not a foul is occurring over here and we can't, can't see when the shooter begins their try for goal, right? So in this one, Right. So the key takeaway here is we can make a judgment as the sole official on this play. Obviously, we are officiating this action here in order to put a ruling on the play. That's where our attention is. Our shooter is adjacent to us. Right. They're right there. But we're, we, we, we have to be officiating two things at the same time. And are we, are we going to be at our best in that instance? No, because we're, you know, our attention is, is diffused, as it were, right? So this could be a crew scenario where the crew comes in with information, right? When the whistle sounded, that player had begun their habitual try for goal, or that player had begun their habitual try for goal. I had a good look as trail, even though it was coming into the center's primary. I didn't have a lot to officiate, et cetera, right? So we can have information as a crew, to get this play right. If we determine that indeed the foul occurred, but the player had begin, begun their try for motion, or try for goal, we would score the goal and then enforce the foul, right? If it was bonus, that player, the offended player, the one on the push through would receive bonus free throws, score the goal, bonus free throws, and re resume from there. If we determine that there was no try for goal, then we would just um, handle the foul on this play. But it's a good one because everything is so opened up to us, right? The entire thing is within our field of view here, and we can say, we can start making judgments about, well, all right, what, when, when does this player begin their try for goal, right? If we notice everything about when she catches the ball is habitual, Let's take a look, right? She, her receiving the ball and turning into her shot is all habitual activity, right? And of course, with continuous motion, it's not a question of was the ball released, right? That is not a factor in the equation. Has the player begun their the actions that precede a habitual try for goal. And that's our judgment on this play. If your ruling is no, she had not, there was no upward motion, right? Of course, upward motion is an NBA thing, right? It's not in the NFHS rule book. So these are the factors that come into play on a, on a play like this, but we have to have a complete understanding of what continuous motion is in order for us to make a correct ruling on this play. So. Right. If we're going to score the goal, we're going to score the goal. That's three. And then we're going to enforce the foul, whatever the foul was. If it was uh, a common foul, obviously, which, which uh, would be the ruling on this play, 
and their, their team was not in the bonus, they would be awarded the ball for a sideline throw in at the spot nearest the foul. And if they were in the bonus, the offended player, the one who got pushed through, would receive bonus free throws. I would say going sideline, not end line here, but right. It, when in doubt, go end line. That's our, always our counsel. When in doubt, go end line, right? The first contact, right, is not, doesn't rise to the level of the foul. And then we got sort of the bulldozer effect where she then, ex, you know, uh, drives through the player, displacing her, right? And at that instant, that player had begun their habitual try for goal, right? Right, so let's say you are the trail. You, this is your game. You are the trail. What are you going to do? Right, that, play, that official has wiped the goal, uh, the try. Says no try, right? Is this something that we can provide information for, right? Can we get this play right as a crew, right? Almost always push through the screen while a player's releasing a try is going to be a crew call or there's going to be crew input on the call. It's very tough for an individual official to make the correct ruling here. It's easy to have a habitual reaction, but not always easy to have the correct ruling. So think about it as trail, right? What are we going to do? If we believe strongly that that player had begun their habitual try for goal, hey, 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 partner, 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 I had a great look. When you blew your whistle or when the foul occurred, that player had begun her habitual try for goal, right? And again, we're making a factual statement, right? We're making a statement, begun their habitual try for goal, right? Partner, but she hadn't released it yet. No, but she had begun her habitual try for goal, right? If we own that language and take it with us on the court, we're in good shape. And the official might say, <laughs> may not believe that that is worthy of changing anything because they had made the call and they're going to hold on to their call, et cetera, right? But we want to think these, th these things through, right? If we have that strong belief that that player's goal should be counted, right? Put the game ahead of the crew, ahead of you, right? I'm going in. That's my approach. When I get to this fork in the road, what do I do here? Do I keep my mouth shut? Do I say something? Right? What am I going to say? Right? If I can make a declarative statement in a situation where we have a continuous motion play, hey, partner, partner, she was shooting the ball. Right? I could slow our partner down and say, no, I had it. I had the foul first back here, et cetera. Right? Good. Good. But if we are, have that strong opinion, that's what I have on this play, right? We can, we can offer that information, right? And if we're just thinking, I'm just trying to make the game better. I'm not trying to make you look bad. I'm, not trying to, I'm just trying to make the game better. I want to get accurate rulings on the court. Now, if the, game's, if the score in the game is 92 to 12, right? Maybe I'm, I, this game doesn't need to get better, right? <laughs> That doesn't mean we maybe we didn't have that opinion. We, we can't like say, okay, well, I should have some opinion. So I'm going to go say, hey, maybe we should consider, et cetera. No, no. If we have the strong belief, go express the belief and try to make the game better. Because our partner has, like maybe they've made their big emphatic wipe. No, no goal, right? And they've sort of drawn their attention to themselves in that fashion. Well, it's just like, I can't go try to fix this now because that would be embarrassing to my partner, right? But the game says, well, wait a minute, let's deal with the game first it, it, and then potential embarrassment to the partner or potential embarrassment to ourselves by putting the crew ahead of ourselves, right? The game comes first. If we always have that focus, it makes these decisions easier, easier. But a good continuous motion play get the juices flowing, get us thinking about all of the things that relate to that play. But of course, now it is time to move on to play number three.
What do we have on this play? Goal is scored. Player begins the throw in. Defender from out of bounds contacts the basketball. What are the factors we have to consider on this play? This is obviously a technical foul, right? Right? They contacted the basketball. They made the play from out of bounds. Something's, this has got to be illegal, right? What do we have on this play? Goal is scored. The player, the defensive player, is legally out of bounds on this play. The thrower picks up the ball and releases a throw-in pass. The defender, with out-of-bounds status, contacts the ball while it's in the thrower's hand. Right? What do we know about defenders contacting the ball during a throw-in? Right? We know that it's a player may not uh, reach across the boundary line and contact the basketball. Doing so would be a player technical. But where is the ball on this play? That is our key question. Where is the basketball when it's contacted? Because we also know that a player, that when a thrower extends the ball over the court, then a defensive player can legally contact the ball, can legally grab the ball, etc. So we have to make a judgment here about where that basketball is. And of course, from this camera angle, we can't necessarily see. But if that basketball is over the basketball court, then we do not have a player technical. We have a player contacting the basketball and giving that basketball status, right? That player is never establishes inbounds here. So this would be an out-of-bounds violation, or if the ball was not yet over the court when they contacted it, it would be a player technical foul by rule. So our, our, new, or our lead official, New Trail here, has an open look on the play. But that's one that can really, really throw us for a loop. So the position of the ball is the determining factor on this play, whether this is just simply an out-of-bounds violation or whether it is a player technical. If it was contacted and it, the ball was not where the, the ball had not been extended over the court and the ball was contacted, that would be a player technical. If the ball had been extended over the court, this would be an out-of-bounds violation by rule. This is a complicated play, one that it's great to see it here so that when we see it out there, we can make a judgment about it. So, the things to think about here. Well, wait, uh, can a player make a play on the ball while they're out of bounds? Is that legal? Is that something, you, you know, is that, a, first of all, the player got out of bounds legally. It's important to under, understand that. Can a player make a play on the ball with out-of-bounds status? There's nothing to prevent that. There's nothing to prevent that, right? If this same thing, if the same thing was a situation where a defender goes out of bounds, the ball is being passed amongst teammates, they, they attempt to, uh, to uh, steal the ball or deflect a pass from out-of-bounds with out-of-bounds status, it's simply an out-of-bounds violation, right? So this is a really great play. Um, got it from Ronnie Burnett on an NFHS officiating uh, Facebook group. I will put a link to that group in the show notes below as well. Seeing unique plays just forces us, first of all, to break it all down, figure out what are the components, what's legal, what's not legal, what's the rule, what are all of the things, and then we can parse together the correct ruling on the play. But then when we go out and officiate our game and we see something similar, at least we've gone through that process with a video play. And we really appreciate that. Right. First of all, after a made basket, throw-ins, right? There, this, is the, this is the twilight zone of the, of the rules of basketball. So many possible things can happen. Two defenders are out of bounds, plus three offensive players are out of bounds, Right. And the throw-in is made. We've got five players out of bounds because there was, you know, a play at the basket and a lot of momentum players off the court, right? We have players uh, making an attempt to do this, etc. Throwers doing unique things, confused things we'll see on the next clip, etc. 
And then the rules, it's like, well, if you extend the ball over and the other team touches it, you're not out of bounds because this is like a strange thing we had to configure and put together, right? So this is just a unique part of the rules and one that can really set us back when we see it, right? Key thing here is to determine the position of the ball when the defender contacted it. Uh, is a delay of game warning a possibility on this play? Again, the ball was live. Right? The ball wasn't prevented from being made live or the, 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 player, the, uh, the player in white having access to the ball, right? You know, it, it wasn't like he knocked the ball out of the play. You know, he's making a play on the basketball. The player is attempting to pass. He's looking to deflect the pass, right? It's not like he knocked it out of the, of the guy's hands, you know, towards the wall or something like this. During a throw-in, defenders must be on the court. But this, again, this is our sort of twilight zone where multiple players can be out of bounds because, and their momentum took them there legally. If an offensive player in this situation throws the ball in before the defender, I mean, this defender is not lingering out of bounds. He's immediately looking to return. He has out-of-bounds status. Legal. Oh, this is a great clip. This is a great clip because it... it you know, everybody's in the wrong place, right? The defender's making a play from out of bounds. How often do you see that? A fantastic clip, one that really forces us to have a complete understanding of rules and restrictions in this wildly unique situation. How about a throw-in play that's a little simpler to parse out? Let's take a look at play number four. That's a little simpler, right? So we have a scored goal. Team, a player goes to the ball to get, uh, to throw in to a teammate, sees their teammate is being guarded, and that uh, action that they had on the ball is interrupted, and the ball bounces on the court. What are the factors that come into play on this play? Had this, has this player released a throw-in pass? If he had released a throw-in pass, he may not be the first to touch the ball after it's been on the court. Had the throw-in begun, right? In this situation, when does the throw-in begin? It begins when the, call, when the trail official begins their five-second count. So the throw-in has begun, right? Is this player allowed to fumble the ball onto the court here and then recover the ball? If the same, if they had fumbled the ball and it remained out of bounds, that would be legal. Is this legal, right? Yeah. So another throw-in play, one that can really take us aback. Hard for us to make a correct ruling in real time. We're processing heavily. Heavily, right? We see these plays and it's just like we have to think through all of the things, etc. We don't want to put a reaction whistle on a play. We want to process, right? And get the call right. In this instance, it appears we should have had a violation on the play. But let's move on now to play number five. So, unofficiated play here. 
one that's unfortunate to have in our game. Uh, to me, there's no doubt that is an intentional act. That is a flagrant act. Right? It's possible for players to try to swing their arm through to gain position. Sometimes you can have inadvertent contact in this situation. Ball handler attempting to, to move the ball from right to left contacts the, uh, the opponent with an elbow. That could be an inadvertent thing. In this instance, I think we have a flagrant act and it's unofficiated. And if we look at it, what would make us uh, for, make this play be unofficiated? Right. So how could we how could we ensure right that we get this? So our center official here, there's one defender in the backcourt. Right. Our center official, our training says that we're going to move with the next to last defender into the front court. If that next to last defender had stayed, then our center stays. So this is really the lead is on an island here and has to get this. So what are the habits and fundamentals? And what could we do differently so that we would have a better look at this play, right? So obviously the official leaves the trail position early and steps onto the court, forcing them then to be looking backwards at the thrower, right? This is an undefended throw-in. Our, our, you know, we need to find the, the action on the play. Our first competitive matchup is those two players right there. We want to have an open look, peripheral vision on the thrower here. We have to see the feet, but we want to see the action on this play, what's going to happen next, right? And in this instance, what was going to happen next is not something we want in our game, right? So uh, we don't know what preceded this action in this game, <clears throat> Um. But that is a flagrant foul, that elbow to the face. Um, it does not look inadvertent in the least. Right? We could take a look at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the boxing out of the thrower here. Is this legal action? That's not good. Right? Our... Uh, Player ultimately moves from a lark mark lane space, boxes out our shooter. Whether she puts her foot down, it's close. There's no displacement. There's no foul there um, on that play. So what we have in the end is unofficiated action. We don't have eyes on this play, and we miss the flagrant act on this play right so when we analyze our game video it's like oh my gosh we never want to miss we never want to have unofficiated action especially if that action rises to the level of foul intentional foul flagrant foul right sometimes we have to change our focus right we can only focus on so much for working two person it's harder for working three person the system is designed so that we don't have unofficiated action so what are our habits and fundamentals on a play that lead us to unofficiated action right in this instance i'd say the trails positioning by making the habitual movement onto the court forces the official to look back and not be able to see the play but our mindset also in this situation is Yes, I am observing the thrower for a possible violation, but this does not deserve 100% of my attention. This only deserves a sliver of my attention. All I have to see here is, does the player step onto the court and violate in that fashion? I can do that maybe with, a, with less focus on them. What's my first competitive matchup? That's the important, that's the value uh, on this play. So, I think uh, we could look at the video and say, okay, do I have that habit in my game? Do I step onto the court habitually, assuming we're going to move down the court? And does it potentially put me in the same position? And if we can get better uh, from just seeing that, then the value is added. Again, we can have inadvertent contact in these situations, right? Players m attempting to get their body, their arm, to the other side of the defender, right? Swim over 
et cetera. This is not an uncommon, uh, something that happens on the basketball court. This player uh, measures that player up and uh, makes contact, in my judgment. All right, a great play to review for habits and fundamentals. Now let's take a look at a bonus play. All right, so what do we have? This is a bonus situation. Defensive player deflects the ball. The ball becomes loose. A foul is ruled on the team in red. And the game says, let's go shoot bonus free throws. <clears throat> this is not an uncommon scenario. Let's say in bonus situations, when a foul occurs on a play like this, the game has gravity. Everybody wants to go down and shoot bonus free throws. But... Is this a situation where bonus free throws are merited, right? If the, or is this a team control foul? And what can we learn about a play like this, right? So the ball is deflected. The ball is loose. Players attempting to control the ball. In the end, a foul is ruled on red. Has a change of possession occurred? Is this player holding or dribbling the basketball? In, because we have to understand about team control, of course, of course, we have to understand about team control is that team control exists until one of three things occur. The ball becomes dead. The other team gains control by gaining player control, which would involve a player holding or dribbling the basketball. Or a player releases from White here would release a try for goal, and then team control ends. Those are the three ways the team control ends. So does team control end on this play? That's our determination here. We see a player who's attempting to control the ball, displaced by red, our calling official, displays great, great multi-talent uh, here, the ability to stop the ball from rolling while she's reporting, etc. And the game says... Let's go shoot bonus free throws because everybody knows. Everybody knows this bonus, right? So our key determination here is making a judgment about whether player control was gained by White prior to the foul being occurring and making the proper ruling. And our judgment on plays like this is learn to identify these plays each and every time. So that when you get to a bonus situation, when you get to a bonus situation, you have reps, you have practiced in identifying team control fouls. This is a team control foul by rule. No free throws should be shot, right? And we have to fight. We have to be prepared to fight against the gravity of the game. All the players, all of the officials, all the stakeholders in the game think we're going to shoot bonus free throws. We need to identify, right? What, how can we help with that? No change of possession, team control foul, sideline out of bounds, right? No change of possession. If we can take that with us, that's a great tool to have. Um, so our calling official rules a foul and points out of bounds, right? Maybe it was, this is the way I like to explain it. We're on the court and I say, hey, partner, next time we're bonus down here. I tell the crew, we're in bonus down here. Two seconds later, I rule a foul, sideline. <laughs> Calling officials, right, in the moment can sometimes be distracted and, and, and make reaction uh, ruling, you know, rulings on a play. Ruling, that's a common foul, sideline, right? Right, as a crew, as a crew, we have to be able to fix these things, right? So if you are the lead on this play, 
right? Hey, did we have a change of possession on that one, right? I know maybe we did, maybe we didn't the way it was going. I could ask that question, right, to help clarify here. But I'd say our number one takeaway is when these plays occur, ask yourself, did a change of possession occur? Was the player holding or dribbling the basketball? And in the absence of that, we have a team control foul by rule. And it's all the linchpin here. The key, the key determination is going to be, did the player have player control? Were they holding or dribbling the basketball? Remembering that, of course, that dribbling the ball is a player in control pushing the ball to the floor. If we're batting the ball around in an attempt to gain control of the basketball, we are not dribbling by rule. Hey, thanks for joining us today for Five Play Friday. Appreciate you sticking around to the end. Now would be a great time to do all of the things. Make sure to like the video. It really helps us with the YouTube algorithm, gets the video in front of more basketball officials. Also hit subscribe and notify so you don't miss out on any of our new content. Allow me a moment to thank the people who fuel our broadcasts, our tremendous show supporters. Bob Marshall, Zach Burns, Eric Erickson, Greg Godsell, and Paul Sullivan. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? You can always head to a better official. I'll put a link above and in the show notes below. We've got additional video content available for you here. This is a selection that I've made. This is a selection YouTube makes. You make your selection. We'll see you in the very next video. Take care.